and pretty much everybody hinges for like two inches and then they just have spinal flexion to take them through the rest of the range of motion yeah yeah come on <laughs> don't judge me <laughs> <laughs> Welcome back to another episode of the Casually Fit Life Podcast. We are your hosts, Tyler Fisher. Anthony Mobile. We've got a special episode today. Well, yes, it is particularly special. Particularly special because it is a, another episode of your favorite fitness podcast. Obviously, obviously. So what do we have on the agenda today, Ty? Where are we starting here? First one we're going to go over is the 10 general physical skills um, that come from, I believe, Dynamax, but we might know them through CrossFit. So we'll go over what those are. And then number two, we have a fitness myth, uh, which should we tell you the myth or should we make you wait for it? Let's wait for it. Let's wait for it. Yeah, let's wait for it. And then we'll finish up with a... um, our, our, I don't know what you want to call our third um, round. It's like a, it's like anything goes kind of round. Anything goes. It's like third base, you know, anything goes. Yeah, exactly. No one actually knows what it stands for. So you can do whatever you want with it. But we're going to go over an interesting topic of language learning. So we'll get into that. Nice. All right, cool. So you, you mentioned uh, Dynamax's 10 general physical skills. So I agree with you. I learned about this through CrossFit. So shout out to uh, Jim Crawley and Bruce Evans. Those are the names of the guys who make med balls that are way too expensive. <laughs> yeah, but they are, they're still good med balls though. I would say that they are markedly better than any other med ball I've ever used, but they are still too expensive. Fair but our gym me. bought Fair a bunch enough. of them, so they might as well keep it up. Yeah. All right, so um, let's just name them and then go from there. So you can break down fitness into, or they chose to break down fitness into 10 separate categories. And then in those 10 separate categories, there are a subdivision of them. And then each subdivision has a descriptor also in a category. So that's super confusing. But what we have is cardio res- cardiovascular respiratory endurance, stamina, strength, flexibility, and power. So those are your biological, yep. biological traits. Then you have coordination, agility, balance, accuracy, and speed. Those are your neurological. Right. Now, I wasn't counting. Was that all 10? I counted on my, ha- my hands, but I, I couldn't. No, I trust more. you. I trust you. Because the way I remember it, I haven't gone over these in a while, but the way I remember it was there was at least one or two that they categorized as like a mixture of both. Yep, that's speed and power. Right, exactly. Mm -hmm. Okay, cool. So which one do you want to start with first, the biological or the neurological? Let's start off with the biological. And before before we even go into them, um, like all of them individually, CrossFit decided to use this as one of their like models of what fitness is and how to define it and and, uh, how to measure it. So like their, their concept was across all these 10 domains, if you are, I guess you would say above average in all of them or sufficient in all of them, um, whatever that means, then you would be considered fit. And if you were lacking in one of them, then you, you know, that's a weakness that you had to work on. So that's kind of how they broke it down. It was one of their models. I think they had a couple other models that they used to describe fitness, but that was just one of them. Yeah. The way that they describe fitness is in my opinion, unparalleled. I it's agree. Yeah. Objective, it's measurable and it's repeatable. And that makes it super easy. It's not just like someone who's generally healthy and they can do what they want to do with their lives and their bodies, but we can get more concise than that. Right. And I, I think this was a good step towards getting more concise. So let's go. Biological. So why is this called biological? Because this is a representation of how your body exists. I don't know if that's a good definition exactly, but this is how big your muscle is, how long your tendons are, how much force can they create in a given load, right? So let's start with the first one. So cardiovascular, that's your heart and lungs or respiratory endurance. So the ability of the body systems to gather, process, and deliver oxygen. 
Nice. Cool. So give me a test that you would use to test someone's basically as broad as you could cardiovascular endurance. This could be like a 5k run, something like Perfect. that. Perfect. Perfect. Yeah. Yeah. It could be shorter, it could be longer, but, um, the idea is that you're breathing heavy and it's not limited by your muscular capacity. Right, right, right. I dig it. Yeah. And these are all hard to test individually because you always get a movement or a test is a combination of a couple of things. Like when you do a bench press, you're testing flexibility as well as strength and stamina, right? Or even coordination. coordination. So it's really difficult to test one individually, but this would be like your classic marathon runner or your rower or your swimmer. Yep. What we, what we all think of as cardio, right? And I like that they always list this one first and at least in my head, because when someone thinks of traditional health and wellness, you know, we've talked about this, like which sport is the healthiest. They always say, oh, are you doing, you know, your cardio 30 minutes of activity every day, you know, to make your heart beat, to make your lungs work hard. And you improve these things by overtaxing your system and then they recover. And this is called hypercompensation. Yes. Hypercompensation. So it's really easy when you think about strength, right? When you lift a heavy weight, your muscles are sore, so they're damaged Mm -hmm. and then they don't return back to baseline. They return beyond baseline Mm -hmm. and then you repeat that pattern forever so cardiovascular respiratory endurance is like your your classic aerobic athlete nice now next one here is stamina right yep and this one is uh easily confusable with yes the first one Mm -hmm. um and i know it was for me in the beginning but let me see i'm sure you have a definition there but let me see if i can um come up with it. And the way I always understood it was, as you said, cardiorespiratory endurance was like oxygen, the heart and the lungs. And then stamina is more of like the metabolic processes that you have like like, uh, on a cellular level. Mm -hmm. Now you tell me what you got. So, end quote, the ability to process, deliver, store and utilize energy. So to make it a little bit more of a useful or active definition, I thought of it as the ability to repeat submaximal muscle contractions. Okay, I like it. I think I think a good um, I think a lot of the OPEX energy system training um, that they lay out, not the MAP stuff, the maximal aerobic power section, but all their other stuff that's sub uh, aerobic. I think that's all a very appropriate um, training methodology for stamina because it is a lot of repetitive, um, can you repeat the effort sort of thing. Yeah, I would say a combination of stamina and cardiovascular endurance training would be the most effective. Yeah, for sure. You're doing submaximal repetitive muscle contractions and your heart and lungs are working hard to try and allow those things to continue. Well, yeah, you can't get away from the cardiorespiratory aspect of it. You just can't. Yeah. So you have cardiovascular respiratory endurance and stamina. So, um, do you have an athlete or a test in mind for stamina? Um, you could do something like I did the other day, which is probably a decent, uh, training or test of it, which was 20, 30 seconds on 30 seconds off on the echo bike for 20 minutes. Nice. And did you measure your pace over and over and over again? I was watching the RPMs. Um, I guess you could also watch the wattage, but uh, I was watching the RPMs. Yeah. Yeah. So I like to think about this one as like push ups or sit ups or a plank because you're not really breathing heavy as much as you're trying to repeat the same sub maximal push up. If you can only do one push up, then you're working on our next one. But if you're doing, you know, a bunch of push ups, then that's kind of where that's what I, I think of when I think of stamina. Okay. No, I I like that. So you're thinking of it maybe in like a a muscular endurance sort of way. Yeah. That's, I guess that's the way that I discern the two. One is more purist of cardio and the other is a little bit more purist of muscle endurance. Right. And I guess what I was just getting at with the bike is maybe a mixture of both there. Still a good test of, of both. Uh, It just depends on how you're tackling it. Are you doing 30 second sprints? Are you doing 30 seconds of repeated force efforts? Right. And And if you're measuring if the cardio is super weak and it's limiting you, then you're not really going to be able to test the stamina component. 
Right, right. But the two do go hand in hand, right? The stronger the athlete leading us onto point number three, the more easily it is they can handle submaximal contractions, right? So strength is the ability of a muscular unit or a combination of muscular units to apply force. Right, so this right. is your one rep max. Yeah. Super easy. You know, we're not looking at range of motion, really. We're not looking at more than one rep. We're not looking at, you know, how well you do the movement. It's how much weight can you move at one time? Right. And, and for a test for this, you know, I don't think there's the perfect test, but mm -hmm. I think, I think I like the deadlift as a good test. Oh yeah. Um, just because of what you just said there about range of motion, it takes that out of it. There's, yeah. it starts on the ground. Like that's, that's unambiguous and it stops when you stand all the way up. There's no perfect. question. If you do it in a trap bar, that's like my all time favorite measure of strength. Ooh, yeah. Trap bar. I like that. I did some of those the other day. They're great. It's nice because they're so simple compared to a traditional deadlift. Especially if you have the ones like some of them are just at the same height as an Olympic bar, but mm -hmm. some of them have that extra handle too. Yep. So you can do either height. So I like that. Yeah. Perfect. Perfect. Perfect test. Yeah. Uh, we used to use it all the time at one of the gyms I would coach in. Their workout, their A1 was always trap bar deadlifts, like sets of three to six yeah. somewhere in there. Cause you can really determine a lot from them. I just find uh, that that trap bar deadlift with the extra, with the higher handle um, is a much like safer movement for most people. So uh, yeah. Yeah. It's like a hybrid between a squat and a deadlift too. Cause your positioning yeah. is a little bit different. It's probably more um, like athletic, but okay. Uh, I think strength is literally the easiest one to test because yeah. stamina has a little bit of mental fortitude to it. Like it's going to burn, but you can always do one more body weight squat, or you can always hang out in the plank a little bit longer, you know? So this is pick it up. Well, it's super measurable because mm -hmm. you can increment by, you know, they have those quarter pound plates that you can put That's on. Right. You know what I That's mean? Right. So you yeah, can super really measure pretty precise. Now this one, I, I don't like, cause I'm not traditionally flexible. That's the word flexibility. So maximize the range of motion at a given joint. And the easiest one, everyone who's been in elementary school, you did the presidential fitness test and you did the V sit and reach the seat, the seated like toe touch thing. Yep. Your feet are apart or together and you just reach as far as you can. And pretty much everybody hinges for like two inches and then they just have spinal flexion to take them through the rest of the range of motion. Yeah. Yeah. Come on. <laughs> Don't judge me. <laughs> <laughs> so I have terrible hamstrings, but great back mobility. Yeah. Right. And we've mentioned this before, but flexibility and mobility, I think are terms that are different. One, I would say mobility is more of a neurological component. That's your ability to show strength or show control at end range. So this is purely how far can you go? Yeah. And I, I do like it. I, I think it's super important and super, um, or I should say often like underappreciated, yeah. you know, the ability to get in proper positions in order to express strength. Uh, so I think it's something that we should all take seriously, even though, you know, most of us struggle with it. Cause it's boring, right? Sit in a position for two minutes and then switch. It's boring, but you can do it while you're watching Netflix or listen to a podcast or something. This like is that. true. This is true. It's your favorite fitness podcast. That's right. I, I know one or two good ones. I just know one. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So we've gone through four of the 10. You have cardiovascular endurance, stamina, strength, and flexibility. Now, when you combine those four, this is when you get a power output. So power is the ability of a muscular unit or combination of muscular units to apply maximum force in a minimum amount of time. So the power component has a time element to it. Yeah. And that's super important. It's not enough to just stand up 225. If it takes you five or 10 seconds, we want you to stand it up in one second. So yeah. you're now powerful. Yeah. Some, some might say, so you can now power clean. Whoa. Whoa. Is that a good test? I think that is. I think so. I think so. It's dynamic. You're loading the hamstrings. You're forcing a combination of movements. You're lifting a heavy load. It's a good test, but I also like um, like a slightly longer test too, like in the 10 second range or 15 second range, which could be like a, 
bike or a sled or something like that. Yeah, that's miserable. That sounds absolutely terrible. Yeah. Yeah, I like that. Yeah. yeah. Oh, you like that. Uh, nobody likes that. But no, I mean, I don't like to do it. I like to put people through it. <laughs> right. Yeah. It's better for them, obviously. Obviously. Yeah. So power is the one where you start to get a little bit tricky. So if you find that you're weak in power, right, like an Olympic weightlifter, uh, doing more Olympic weightlifting, you will hit a roadblock and you won't be able to go past a certain weight until you go back to your strength. Mm -hmm. until you improve your flexibility until you improve your stamina right so you work sets of five or ten at submaximal loads and you increase those loads over time and then the power should come up as a result of the combination of those right and we can even keep it rolling the flip side of that coin um if you're struggling with olympic weightlifting like you said and and it's not the strength the flip side is it's the speed that's right and that's the next component here, the next uh, skill, general physical skill here. And Olympic weightlifting at light weights, moderate to light weights can help you improve that speed component. Yeah, yeah, for sure. So the speed is the combination of the last four. That we're gonna so, get into, yeah. Yeah, so power and speed kind of sit at the top of the pyramid. And then underneath each one of those is like a family tree. And then you have endurance, stamina, strength, and flexibility. Now underneath speed, coordination, accuracy, agility, and balance. Nice. I like it. These all sound like the, um, these all sound like play a little bit. Yeah. And people don't do that enough in their life. No, especially not as we get a little older. So you got coordination, which is, uh, the idea of like being able to put motor patterns together, like in a coherent fashion, right? Mm -hmm. What do you got there for that? The ability to combine several distinct movement patterns into a singular distinct movement. So when I think of this, I think of like throwing or catching. You're flexing certain muscles, extending certain ones. You're making them do things at the same time. Um, One of my favorite warm-up games for like a, a young athlete is I'll have them take two balls and just dribble them both at the same time. And then you have them cross right they're not there's no limit of strength it's can you make your right and left hand match or you have them stand on one leg or you have like a an agility ladder and you give them a pattern and can they hold on to that pattern right right well then why don't we talk about that agility yeah i knew it as soon as i said it i I thought damn it i hit the taboo word i'm out that's okay that's okay i'm out so i think of agility as Mostly what I, when I think of agility, I think of change of direction. That's what I think. Mm-hmm. So, so your, your definition is moving from one movement pattern into another or combining several distinct movement patterns into a singular distinct movement, right? Oh, no, from one movement to another. Yeah, that's it. So, so agility might be like being able to move from one um, distinct movement to another with like minimal time in between or something like that. Sprint, cut. Exactly. Going forward, going sideways. Um, Or like if you're in baseball, you take that swing and then you stop your swing and you go into a bunt. Nice, okay. Yeah, Do you? I don't really know if I have a good weightlifting one with this one because we try not to. I guess technically if you're like deadlift, high pull, overhead press, it's like a clean and jerk kind of thing. Nah, this is a hard one. I, when I think of agility, I, for me, I always think of that change of direction. So I would, I would think like anything where you're, you got to be like running, I think in some fashion, you got to be on your feet doing something like that. So there's like a cardio component to it. No, I mean, just like when I think of weightlifting, that's all coordination to me. Mm -hmm. Like, I don't see the agility component there. I guess if you got technical, maybe but it'd be pretty contrived, I think, <laughs> to call yeah, it. Well, I guess, what about like parkour and free running? Is that agility or is it coordination? It's like a little bit of everything. There's a lot of coordination involved, for sure. Yeah. I think agility might involve something like um, when you're doing parkour, let's say a lot of times when they're doing parkour, they they have it mapped out. Like if they're shooting a YouTube video, they run the runs or the lines or whatever they call them. Like they run them over and over again until they get it right. And it's like, it's 
totally predictable. You know, I think if you're in like a chase for, oh. for your life or, or you're playing tag, let's say, uh, let's keep it, keep it Little PG. world tag league. Have you ever seen that? On the yes. Island? It's crazy. Yeah. So like that, I think there's a lot of agility involved there because the coordination is like the movements themselves. Like, do you know how to get over this object or around this bar or whatever? But the agility is like real time thinking like you went this way, but he's over there now. So you got to go the other way and come, you know, make it smooth. And so maybe reactionary would be a good word to put in here. Yeah. I think the reaction time is important. Yeah. So I guess you train this by having a wild animal chase you or uh, chasing a chicken or play tag. Oh my God. I feel like I could not catch a chicken. It'd be pretty tough. I bet. I'm like kind of not so confident about that. I'm not super confident either, especially in just like an open field. I don't know. Especially if, if I'm, uh, maybe I'd have a better chance if I'm hungry. Yeah. You figure it out. All right. So our last two here, you have balance and accuracy. So I think balance is a super easy one to define. So the ability to control the placement of the body's center of gravity in relationship to its support base. And I always think of a gymnast on a beam. Always. Yeah. Same. But I think maybe a little more real life would be like single leg exercises would be a great way to do it. Yeah. Yeah. You don't need to go buy a balance beam and risk your, uh, <laughs> risk your life. Yeah, probably. Or risk anything between your legs. If you try and do something yeah. miss, that would yeah. be like your parkour guy running on a railing. And people always say that when you run on rails, you flip off walls, you know, that's fun. <laughs> Um, but balance is a little underrated too, because you have eyes open balance and you have eyes closed balance, and then you have reactionary. So we call them perturbations. So you just, if something outside of your control or know-how causes you to come off balance, can you return back to center? Mm, that's super important. Yeah. I mean, when you think about someone that falls, they didn't just like stop walking and fall over. They slipped on something and they're trying to regain their balance and the fall is a little bit awkward. So, I mean, that's the order I'd teach it. Eyes open, eyes closed, and then you have someone else messing around with you. Yeah, there's a lot of options for that too. Yeah, some degree of uncertainty. I feel like we're just talking about Cirque du Soleil now. Yeah. <laughs> um, and then accuracy, our definition here is the ability to control movement in a given direction or at a given intensity. So this is always a pitch or a quarterback. Yeah. Yeah. I think, well, yeah. Like the throwing accuracy is an obvious example, I think. And that's a totally valid example. But then the last piece was like the intensity, mm -hmm. um, which I guess comes into play with like, if you're a quarterback too, cause you got to throw it f the right distance. Right. Yeah. Um, but that could come, I guess, in, in a whole lot of other ways too. Right. Like, um, trying to think of a good example actually i can't <laughs> i mean a baseball pitch you throw a change up right so you still want to hit the same spot but you hit it and it's slower or you hit it and oh, it's faster okay. or you make it move to that spot from somewhere else right right or like an ultimate frisbee right you have a backhand a forehand and an overhead toss right and you still have the same outcome the location but it it changes whether you have to chuck it or if you can like lob it over to that same spot Oh, golf is a good one. Oh man, golf, golf definitely falls in the latter half of these these topics it's here. All of them. It's all of the latter. <laughs> like you, you can't just be like the only one you don't really need. I think is agility, but the rest <laughs> of them you need like the world class level of all of them. <laughs> yeah. So at one point I was reading an article about, of course it was like a CrossFit fanboy, I'm sure, but they were talking about different Olympic sports and that they shouldn't be considered an Olympic sport unless they cross the threshold. I think they said seven or more of these domains should be tested because otherwise it's like, it's not a true test of human performance. Like Jerry Seinfeld has made the joke about the luge and you could accidentally win the luge. Yeah. Technically. I mean, it was definitely a CrossFit fanboy that wrote that because oh, yeah. I, I disagree. I think sports are just whatever you want them to be, whatever you want to compete in. And if it's just who can balance the longest, we're gonna have this. Comp we're gonna have a three-day competition and see who can stay on the beam the whole time. And the countries want to uh, put their flags on that, then go for it. All right, I'm gonna give you an exercise, and I want you to 
tell me all the categories it falls into. Do you have them in front of you? Um, I can pull them up. Let me see. All right. Got them. Max distance handstand walk. Max distance handstand walk. Well, we're going to have some, I'm going to go down the list here. Mm -hmm. So cardiovascular endurance, I'm going to say not really. Stamina, I'm going to say, yeah. Um, well, potentially, I guess. Strength, not really. Flexibility, yeah. Speed, power, no. And then obviously coordination, balance. Yeah, coordination and balance. Those are the major ones, I would say. That's pretty good. I like it. I think a handstand would be a pretty useful tool for increasing your fitness overall because you hit a lot of the domains. You do. Like when I said stamina, I said maybe stamina because the limiting factors are going to be coordination, coordination and balance. And mm -hmm. so you might not even get into the stamina component if you don't have those down. Right. But if you do, then you'll get there. All right. Do you have more? Was that it? Oh, I don't know. Do you have one? A good one? A tricky one. I feel like one of these should involve a medicine ball to give ode to Dynamax. Okay. Okay. Then let's say, no, nah, I didn't want to go with that one. That would be too, well, all right, Karen, the workout Karen, 150. Oh, God. As long as I don't have to do it, I'll talk about it. Yeah. Um, so I will say, I'll go down the list too. I am not going to include cardiovascular endurance in Karen. Okay. I, I'm going to have, because I think you either have to choose between cardiovascular endurance or stamina. And in this case, I'm going stamina. And is that because I agree actually with that, because I think that's going to be the limiting factor is stamina. And is mm -hmm. that why you say you have to choose because one of them is going to right. be the other? Right. Yeah. Cause you could, in theory, if, if you're strong enough, you can't really go any faster in Karen, you can be short or you could be taller and closer to the target, or you could be shorter and further from the target. But I think that you either tax stamina or you have to stop and recover. And then you're talking cardiovascular endurance. Yeah. Um, definitely not strength, yep. but because of the light load of Karen, but the higher your strength output is, the more likely it'll be that you'll be able to complete these sub maximal reps. Like 50 per, if your max yeah. wall wall is 40 pounds, it'll be really hard to do 150 at 20 versus if you can do like a 250 pound thruster, you could probably do pretty well in Karen. Yeah. Um, flexibility is a tricky one too. I am going to say, no, because I don't think a squat or an overhead press is really like outside of the bounds of I was going to say no. Yeah, power definitely because we're comparing time. Mm. Speed, um, you are trying to minimize the cycle time. Down and back up, down and back up, down and back up. So that's where I don't know. I'm not sure about speed. But coordination, yes, because you have to hit a target. Agility, no, you're doing the same movement pattern over and over and over and over again. Balance, no, you have a wide stance, your center of gravity is probably pretty well distributed. And then accuracy, yeah, you got to hit the same target at the same time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I agree with that. I would say, what? which one were you unsure of? Speed? Is that what you said? Yeah, I'm unsure of speed. I mean, look, there's a component of all of them in there. Mm -hmm. So there's definitely a component of speed. But I would say probably not the, probably not the most taxed or the most emphasized component, you know? Mm -hmm probably not the intent of the workout either. I think stamina, you really hit it right on the, on the head with that one. Yeah. Yeah. That's definitely, Karen is a super fun workout. If you've never done 150 wall balls for time, give it a shot. And if you have done it and you haven't done it unbroken, try to choose a lighter weight and try and do it unbroken. Yeah. I've never done it unbroken. No, but think about how hard it would be with a 10 pound wall ball because you're like, maybe I can. Yeah. I would like that. Actually. I might do that. I might do that yeah. this week. Maybe at some point when uh, when our podcast hits a couple million views, we'll start a blog and we could put out um, a single test for each one of these components and a little bit of a range. And then you could see where your weaknesses lie. And that's that would determine your next avenue of training. I like it. All right. Ready to move on? I'm ready. All, All right. right. We are tackling the fitness myth. Uh, we, we pulled this off of a blog. This was a myth that was on a blog. And the myth was that you need supplements to build muscle. 
that you need, you need supplements to build muscle. If you want to sit on the couch and do absolutely nothing, you definitely need one supplement and it's vitamin S and you will grow muscles. Yeah. You'll get somewhere for sure. Vitamin S. If you guys didn't know what that means, a steroids, super helpful. (laughs) No. Yeah. This is a complete myth, right? Obviously there are millions of people who have been building muscle without supplements um, for, I don't know, centuries. <laughs> I mean, how long have humans been around, right? Millennia, right? Yeah. Um, I always think of like a blacksmith, a traditional oh like 14th century, 15th century blacksmith. That guy does not, and I'm going to say a guy because I'm pretty sure there were only male blacksmiths for like a while. Um, that's all you that's you man i don't know if i agree but that's you yeah i just uh i mean i wouldn't want to do it i'd avoid being a blacksmith at all times or like a coal miner maybe oh the worst way worse but those guys don't have time to have supplements but they are massive yeah repetitive high weight high rep movements of high force over and over and over again and you are going to get big yeah. So like you said, what do you need? You need that resistance training, right? Heavy it's weight. critical. Heavy weight resistance training, right? Uh-huh. Uh, or, you know, just like reps, you know, hypertrophy training. Yeah. But- that's where some of the science is a little bit funky because a lot of strength and conditioning research says that you can do it any specific way. And they're like, oh, hypertrophy is 12 to 20 reps and strength yeah. is five to eight. And then whatever, whatever you want to call it. But Really, you lift heavy weights consistently over time, and you will get a, a hypertrophic response. Yeah, and then the other component um, is you you need to eat enough food. Yeah, so if you want to refute this myth, right, you need supplements or even excessive protein intake to build muscle, you can look at people who have been vegetarian or vegan that are well-muscled. Mm-hmm. And if they're really, really, really paying attention to their diet, um, they're probably in like the one to 200 range of protein grams per day. Yeah. But even if they're not and they're doing consistent weightlifting and they're just not deficient, they can still get to this like well-muscled looking figure. Yeah. Now, obviously here, we're not talking about like Mr. Olympia level yeah. muscle mass. That you do need some supplements for. Yeah, like they're... If- uh, they're known for their supplements, I think. But, you know, that's the extreme. And it always comes into like the word supplement and people forget that all the time. You know, you meet with someone and they're like, how do I get bigger and stronger? Like, what do I need to take? That's a very like Western philosophy. Mm-hmm. What pill, what magic bullet, what makes me not have to actually put in the work to do it? Right. Right. I mean, I get it. That's what I'm looking for. You know, just give me the pill. Yeah. I mean, it'd solve a, it'd solve a lot of problems there. Um, do you think that there is a, a reason to work out one day a week, two days a week, five days a week, seven days a week over any other amount of time? Oh, do, do I think that there's like the appropriate amount to work out or something like yeah, that? Or like a, a minimum effective dose if you want to build muscle a uh, minimum effective dose yeah um not one definitely more than one not seven i'm gonna definitely. say i'm gonna say three is your minimum three is your minimum okay that's what i'm gonna say i want to argue too but i don't think i can justify it well i i hear you because i was kind of thinking that too I, uh, I don't know. It's rough. I think for a beginner, two could do it. Mm-hmm. And I think even if you were trying to just maintain some level of, of muscle mass that is pretty below your like potential, like if you're okay with being sub optimal for you, yeah, then two could probably get away with some of it. But I think three is a good general rule of thumb because yeah. it's, like, it's what you said. You already said about the, you know, um, destroying your muscle and then overcompensating, right? Yeah. 
But if you go too long, then that overcompensation comes back down if you didn't re-stimulate it. Yeah, that's right. That's right. I'm just wondering if you would, the, t- the amount of time you spend working out too is a little bit of a variable here. But if mm-hmm. I do my whole body on Monday and then I do my whole body on Thursday afternoon, like Monday morning to Thursday afternoon, am I going to start the whole cycle over again? Or should I do a squat and press and then, uh, you know, pull and squat and then pull and press back and forth? You know, there, there are a lot of different things that can work. But I feel like three is a smart move. Yeah, I mean, two could work. You could make it work, but it would, wouldn't be optimal. No, it wouldn't be pleasant either because then like, oh my gosh, my arms are completely fatigued and they're dead all right, now I got to do my back. Yeah. You're like, oh God, now these five pound weights feel really heavy and I'm just running out of juice. I honestly think optimal is probably either three or four. Yeah. Yeah. Because then you're not overtaxing any specific area and you're giving it time to recover in between sessions. Exactly. Um, Is there a supplement if someone, I think we've already talked about this, like creatine and protein powder are like the super easy go-tos and a multivitamin. Yeah. 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 And I was actually just thinking about this again today because I haven't seen the sun for like, I don't know, 10 days now. And I definitely should be taking vitamin D. All right. So I've been taking vitamin D and I, I, I was also taking a calcium pill mm-hmm. and turns out the calcium pill has vitamin D in it also. Right. Um, so I just Googled real quickly to make sure that I wasn't taking too much vitamin D with the other supplement. And like, I think I was, I think with the both supplements together, I ended up at like four, three, four thousand um, IUs or whatever it's called. And when I Googled it, it said toxicity sets in around like could set in somewhere around five to 10. Mm-hmm. But then, so I was like, okay, maybe I shouldn't take that D3 supplement. Maybe just use the calcium one because it has it in there. But then I watched this episode of Joe Rogan that came out this past week. I don't know if you saw it, but this guy was on there. Um, I don't remember his name, but he's some sort of doctor and he's talking about supplements and <laughs> they talk about vitamin D because they're talking about coronavirus and it being good for that. Yeah. And, and he says, okay, well, how much vitamin D do you take? He asked the doctor this. The doctor says, I take... I believe he said like somewhere in the ballpark of 70,000 a day. Oh shit. And then Joe Rogan was like, he's like, well, you know, he asked like, isn't that like toxicity? And the guy was just like, ah, no, not really. <laughs> he says the only problem with vitamin D toxicity is with calcium. It can cause you to store too much of it. And so if you're overdoing calcium at the same time, mm-hmm. that could be a problem but he's not, according to him, he doesn't feel like he is overdoing calcium. So he's not worried about it. Wow. 70,000 I use a day. Yeah. So long story short, I went back to taking both of my pills. I figured (laughs) four wasn't a big deal. (laughs) No, no. And I, I have read a couple of stories about like, uh, you know, they do intramuscular injections and I believe those sit around a hundred thousand I use, but they're absorbed a little bit slower so you go in once a quarter and you get hit with a big injection instead of taking these daily supplements okay i like that i mean that sounds great well it sounds easy right but you still have to get an injection so i mean taking a pill is pretty easy yeah it is funny though how supplements aside from protein specific supplements can kick in this like muscle growth pattern because if you are missing something there's an enzymatic process that you just don't have and it's not working effectively. So like maybe you start taking calcium and now all of a sudden, boom, you start blowing up. Yeah. I've been taking calcium and glucosamine slash chondroitin. Is that for your back? No, just for my bones and my joints. Nice. Mainly worried about the knees, but you know. Right, right. We've yet to see the uh, 10 year, I guess we're coming up on it, like the 10 to 15 year longevity career of a CrossFit athlete. Yeah, yeah. You got to take care of yourself if you're doing that. It's true. It's true. You should take care of yourself anyway. You know, eat whole foods, eat lots of veggies, and then uh, check, get your blood test tested so you can take your supplements. 
I like it. I like it. But right. you do not need supplements to build muscle. No, you don't. You don't you even do need, need extra protein. No, but you do need to lift weights and you do need a relatively wholesome diet. Positive in calories, generally. Yes, definitely positive in calories. So Doritos and beer, no supplements, and weightlifting. Yeah, yes. <laughs> nice, nice. Awesome. All right. Well, let's move on to something a little bit more precise or a little bit uh, more intelligible. Yes, let's do it. Let's switch it up. We are going to talk about language learning. Apprender. <laughs> yes. See. Apprender. Apprender. See. All right. That's, so that's all I remember. So that's that's those are my notes. Well, what we both took Spanish in high school, right? So I took three years. Okay, and I took the two year, which was the minimum, I believe. <laughs> <laughs> the forced, the forced minimum. Um, but like, I think. I think there are schools these days where the kids are doing it in like elementary school, which is wild. That's so smart. Yeah, it's it's great. I love that. But um, it makes okay. me feel. It gives me confidence in America. That's something that we're moving towards because you go anywhere else and people speak at least two languages. Yeah, yeah, that's for sure. There's a couple things there. Like one is pretty much anywhere else. Well, I guess if you're talking like Europe or Africa. Um, even the Middle East and most of Asia, there's just a lot of countries that are like, they're all right next to each other and they yeah. all speak different languages. Yep, which is pretty cool. Which is cool. So, but you're, you, it's more, you're more exposed. Whereas like Latin America, there's a lot of different countries, but most of them all speak Spanish. So if you live in, I don't know, like uh, Nicaragua, you might not speak anything other than Spanish just because of the countries around you still speak Spanish too. So. Right. Right. But they all speak English. Most of them. A lot of people speak English, but that's the other component of it is English is like the world's, they call it a lingua franca, which is a, a, a language that's used for like, uh, they use it in the UN, they use it in business, they use it in, to communicate between cultures. They call it a lingua franca. It used to be French. And now it's English. Oh, really? I didn't know French was the previous lingua franca. Yeah, back when the French Empire was like ruling the world. Yeah, but, I, uh, so in America without those other countries around us, and being that our language is the lingua franca of the world, mm -hmm. there's no motivation to learn other languages. Yeah, it's just, it's just I want to be a better person. I want to learn and communicate. Yeah, that's it. And so like I am, the reason we're talking about this topic is because I've been learning um, Spanish for like the past two years now, nice. almost, almost two years on and off in the beginning, but then the past year was a lot more like focused. The, the first thing that I want to talk about here is that when speaking to other people in a different language, they are always, always, always happy that you're trying and they appreciate it. So first of all, don't be embarrassed. Yes, that's the number one thing is tr don't be embarrassed. Like, like I know how it is sometimes when somebody speaks broken English to you mm -hmm. and maybe when they leave or whatever, somebody will make a joke and it'll be like laugh about it. But really, if you've never tried to speak to somebody in another language, you don't know how impressive it is that they were just able to communicate the idea to you and you understood yeah. what they were getting at. You know what I mean? Yeah. That's a very American thing. It's like, very oh, your English is bad, but I've never tried to talk to anyone in Arabic or French or German or Japanese. Exactly. And just the mere fact like that you can communicate an idea to somebody and they can understand it. Even if the grammar is like, even if the grammar is terrible, you know, it's still really impressive. Yeah. So I, for me, that's like a big hurdle that I want to put out into space because I think it's, it's underrated and underdelivered, and people need to be more willing to put themselves out there. And I think they'll be pleasantly surprised. Yep. Yep. Absolutely. And the one thing that I do um, is there's this app called italki. And what it is, is just, you go on there and whatever language you want to study or whatever 
you search and it has, just has a bunch of teachers on there and they're not, some of them are professional teachers. Some of them are just people who speak the language and they want to make a couple extra bucks. Mm -hmm. um, and you can just set up meetings like a 30 minute session over Skype or whatever. And you just talk to them and they, some of them will be like really structured if you want them to be, but others can just be a conversation and you know, you're paying for it a really cheap price. Most of the time you're paying for it. So you don't have to be embarrassed. So you can kind of get over that sort of like, yeah. Hurdle. That's a good point too. Yeah. You're making a student teacher relationship. Yeah. They're your, they don't expect you to, they expect you to be a student, you know, they don't expect you to have it down. So it's mm -hmm. a good place to go and try it out. So you and your partner are both working on Spanish, correct? Yes. Yep. So when you two practice on each other, I'm curious as like a fly on the wall of someone who speaks Spanish really well. I wonder if you two sound you know, intelligible, or you both have the same, like the same mistakes, if you will. Right. Cause you guys are learning together without a third person saying, Hey, that's, that's a little weird. Do it this way. So what do you, what have you found from learning with her to learning with a tutor? So you're right. Like there's no bad one, habits. No, you're right. There's no one to point out the mistakes, right? Like there's no, mm -hmm. if it's just us, if neither one of us are fluent, there's no one to tell us where we're wrong. Um, but thank you for making that a little bit more concise. My point was a little wandery. No, no. But when I talk to people on Skype who are natives, they, I have conversations with them. So they definitely understand me and I understand mm -hmm. them. So I can't be that far off on my own. Right. right. If they're able to understand me. So I, I have some level of confidence that even when I'm talking, uh, without a native speaker there that I'm generally in the ballpark you know i have some mm -hmm. some level of confidence of that just because like i said i can have conversations with people um so the other point i would make is like i watch like netflix in spanish or like listen to podcasts or whatever in spanish and so it's kind of like mm -hmm. those sources of input over time i'm doing a lot of it that's going to ingrain like the right patterns of speech into me Right. And then the speaking component is just me trying to like sort through it and produce those patterns, but not necessarily correct anything all the time, if that makes sense. Like just trying to take all the input that's been washing over my brain that I've been paying attention to and then just practicing putting it out as I've heard it, if that makes sense. So even so sometimes I'll be wrong if I'm trying to say some sort of grammatical construction that I've never heard before. Mm -hmm. or some phrase that I've never heard before and I'm trying to figure out what it might be, then I might be wrong. But um, if it's something that I've heard a lot on TV or in a podcast or something, chances are I'll probably get it right even when, even if I hadn't said it before. Yeah, idiomatic speech makes that like tricky until you know. Yeah, well, that's the whole other, like there's Spanish and then there's all the different slang in Spanish. Yeah, yeah which happens in English so often that it becomes an actual word. Yeah, yeah, for sure. I mean, look, if you go, I've never been to Australia, but they say, if you go there, you, you'll you understand the words that are coming out of their mouth, mm -hmm. but you might miss like 50% of the point that they're making because they have different like colloquialisms than we do, you know? Yeah, and that's where speaking with someone who actually is a native is so, so, so valuable. Yeah. yeah. Because while you're technically correct, it's just, it feels weird. It feels wrong. Yeah, exactly. There are those ingrained rules in English too that don't make any sense, but you naturally fall to them. And I think one of, since you're learning Spanish, one of the difficulties going from English to a language like Spanish is the gender relationship of words. Yeah, yeah. That's not something we really have here <laughs> at all. Like no. a book is a book, you know? Mm -hmm. But in Spanish, you know, you have, I mean, book will be one thing, but then like a pillow would be a different thing and they have different genders, whereas mm -hmm. here they're just nouns. Yeah. And then you have like book and novel and magazine and they're, they're similar, but different and unrelated. Yeah, it is. It, that is not super hard. Cause I think most people know that in Spanish, if it ends with an O it's probably masculine. If it ends with an A it's probably feminine. Mm -hmm. But like I said, probably, you know, so there are some exceptions, 
and there, uh, some of those exceptions can be grave, apparently. <laughs> oh no. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So like, so like, here's one that I heard and I don't know which, I don't know where, which country it is, but um, pollo is chicken, P-O-L-L-O, -L -L -O, chicken. Mm -hmm. Um, and in one of the countries, I don't know if it's Spain or some Latin American country, but if you say polla, <laughs> that means penis. <laughs> oh, wow. So you got to be careful. Nice. Uh, so you could, some of those mistakes can be great. Listen, sometimes yo quiero polla and sometimes <laughs> yeah. yo quiero polla. I don't know, man. No say. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. You just got to be happy with whatever comes out. Mm -hmm. that's a but great here, happy like, let me give some of my a couple tips i guess if you if anybody wants please, to try and learn please. language so this is going to sound like no duh in the beginning but if you've tried to learn a language it'll maybe make some sense is focus on the vocab first not the grammar mm -hmm. um because language learning is like definitely i think mostly about learning the words and that sounds like obvious right but yeah. what happens all the time most of the time when people learn a language they pick up a book or something or they go online or whatever and they they hit they're hit with grammar first or that's where they want to start they want to understand the structures of the sentences and while that's important eventually it's just like it's impossible to just understand all of that in the beginning you're yeah. just not going to. You might understand like one or two things, but you're not, those things need to become like internalized on a level that like you don't need to think about it. Mm -hmm. And that's just going to come with time. Whereas if you just learn the vocab and you can get pretty, you can learn vocab pretty quickly um, yeah. for the most part, especially with Spanish when a lot of things look similar to, to English words. Um, so you can learn the vocab pretty quickly. And so even if the grammar's off, you can understand, oh, okay, he was talking about the trash can and he was saying something about, you know, the swimming pool or whatever. Like, I don't know exactly what, I don't know who was in there or what, but I know it was a swimming pool and then there was a trash can and I can put all that together, you know? Mm -hmm. So I think vocab is definitely the way to start. Um, and that's- Would you start with nouns or verbs first? Nouns nouns first well well you know i guess it could go either way but like so i'm also i just started learning arabic which is completely foreign to me a hundred percent like zero anything foundational in that different alphabet completely and so i started with the grammar making my own mistake uh, and then this is where i realized this is i stopped caring about the grammar and started learning just trying to learn as many words as i could and forgetting about the grammar and now I can understand a lot more of the stuff when I read it. Like if I read a children's book in Arabic, it makes a hell of a lot more sense now just because I know what the words are. Mm -hmm. Whereas, and then like, if you know what the words are, especially if you're reading, you can kind of infer what the, gr the grammar means, right? Like, yep. like we might say a black box, but if you're reading and it says box black, you can put that together in your head. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. You can figure out what, what they're talking about. Does Arabic follow that structure? For the Noun, most part. Adjective? Yeah, it seems like it does for the most part, like similar kind of to Spanish, you know? Mm -hmm. And it has that feminine masculine thing too, which is annoying again. <laughs> right, right. So that was actually um, bringing up learning the vocab. Um, Duolingo is extremely good for learning vocab. Yeah, a lot of people, when I started learning Spanish and then I was like Googling like resources for it, a lot of people will hate on Duolingo. Um, I don't know why. I get it actually, I do get it. But what I would say is it's, it's phenomenal when you're just starting and you don't have yeah. anything, it is phenomenal, I think. Um, I'm gonna put an asterisk there because I spent some time on Japanese and uh, anything with the, what is it? The Roman alpha or the Greek alphabet is really well put together and easy to navigate. But when you have to learn new characters, like you need a piece of paper and you just need to write the characters in your yeah. hands. You need yep. to feel what that thing feels like before you move on. Yep, definitely. That's what but I- But if you get across that barrier, 
then it's a lot easier. And you can li- like, that's again, where you can, I don't know about listen to a podcast, but you could like listen to music and you're just like one, this is what one looks like. It's these strokes. Yeah. I'm going to do it the same way every single time. And then that way, when you go over to the word, you can at least sound out the word. Yep. And then you still don't know what it means, but then yep. you go back to the vo- vocab and you can go that way too. So that's, that would be my only caveat. No, that's the exact process I went through with Arabic. Mm-hmm. Um, and I would say to your point, I, I did Spanish Duolingo for a while in the beginning and I thought it was great for the beginning. Um, but then I tried the Arabic Duolingo also and I didn't get as much out of that. So to your point, I think that's, that's right. Um, but the reason I think people hate on it is because it just like, it just doesn't get you to that next level of like, really ultimately you need to get to a point where you can like listen to, I mean, ideally if you could listen to a podcast, like a native podcast and understand it, like that's the ultimate goal, but you can also like get to a point where you can at least read readings easier. So you want to be able to read like the newspaper or something like that um, or like whatever your favorite type of book is. Something, something with like a, like a seventh or eighth grade reading level, like English, when they write in the newspaper, they're not writing collegiate English, right? Simple yeah. words, the same words over and over again. Cause then, cause then what, once you can get to a point where you can read at least, then you can just consume all the content you want. You can just yep. consume it. And then it can just, you're going to start to pick up on things on grammatical things. You're going to start to learn new words. You're going to be interested. Um, so yeah, you got to get right. to that level. Um, so uh, the notes that I took, because I've, I would say in Spanish class in school, I got relatively good at using at vocab, but there wasn't enough time just hammering in the reps of the words. So literally, that would be like the most valuable piece. I totally agree with you. If I were to rewrite the 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 program. So I pulled up. Um, so Tim Ferriss is like, he speaks like eight or 10 languages. And um, one of the things that he talks about is, so you, you say you were like an 80% Spanish speaker, maybe 75%, 90%. Uh, in that ball, somewhere in that ballpark. Like yeah. B's, B plus, you could go to and communicate and be okay. Yeah. I, I, I say, as long as that person is realizing what level i'm at yeah then i can communicate with them unless only if they're trying to intentionally not let me follow (laughs) you know (laughs) which they might do which they might do you never know but one of his craziest tips is so you're learning spanish you know spanish and you're trying to learn arabic don't learn your third language from your first learn your third language from your second yes I do that a little bit with my vocab. I'll write the words. I have an app on my phone. I'll just mm-hmm. put the, the definition in Spanish and then like the the Arabic version, obviously Arabic. Yeah. And Duolingo is cool for that because you pick your language and then you pick the language that you want to learn. So mm-hmm. French to English is a little bit different than German to English. So then you take yeah. German to English and then you take English to French. And now, and a quote from my wife, it felt like a part of my brain that I'd never used before was just waking up for the first time. Yeah. It's interesting. I, I mean, I do have, so here, let me try actually behind the computer. So I have this book here. It's called mastering Arabic and it's, it's in English. with two CDs. That's amazing. Yeah, exactly. Nice. It's in English um, obviously, but Oh, this is actually a good point. I'll just show you like one thing in here. So I got, they have like basic paragraphs in here that you can learn to read. And like, for example, like that paragraph right there, I got to a point where I was able to read that. Oh, and, nice. And if I, and like understand what it means also, not just like pronounce the words. For but all of those of you who are listening, Tyler just showed a picture of an Arabic paragraph. But if you read it in English, it's like the, it's like literally maybe a first grade or second grade reading level. Like it's yeah. like, there is a house and on the house is a bird and like that sort of stuff. Mm-hmm. But like, you got to get to that point eventually. Right. Yeah. Yeah. But what I was getting at with that book is 
yes, learn your third language and your second language, but I'm not like a native speaker in Spanish. Mm -hmm. I'm not even completely fluent yet. So it definitely helps to have some of the more complex topics explained to me in English. Yeah. Yeah. That's a good point. You can like, even when I read, when I read books, there are words that I don't know the definition of, but you read yeah. the context clues around it and you find out basically you get the gist of what you're doing. Yeah, for sure. And I got to tell everyone on the internet, Ty has become an, uh, fascinated by Spanish soap operas. No, not the soap <laughs> operas. Not what? The, not the telenovelas, no. You don't There's, love the telenovelas? No, I'm not a soap opera person. But they do have a lot of good Netflix shows that are in Spanish that aren't all, I don't know how you would describe them, but soap opera-y, you know? Yeah, du yeah right. But That's funny. But no, I do love watching. I, we just recently watched, we just finished like maybe two weeks ago. We watched the whole Marvel Cinematic Universe in Spanish. How are the voice actors? Not bad. Not nice. bad. Nice. And I didn't know that was actually the first time I wanted to, every time I watched something in Spanish, I either wanted it to be like made in Spanish right? or I wanted it to be animated. So that way I wasn't distracted by the dubbing, you know, mm -hmm. the voice dubbing. Um, so that was actually like the first thing that I watched that wasn't made in Spanish, but I watched it in Spanish and the dubbing didn't bother me. I thought it was going to bother me and it didn't. Oh. So that just opened up like a whole world of possibilities. Yeah. Yeah. I like it. And that's an excellent excuse to rewatch all of the Marvel movies. Yeah. They were, dude, there's some good ones in there, man, that you forget about. Yeah. Um, the last thing, I guess. So on conjugation, um, Tim Ferriss put together six sentences that teach you the conjugation. Have you looked at these before? I actually have, yeah. So you have the apple is red. Mm -hmm. It is John's apple. Then you have I give John the apple. We give him the apple. Right, yeah, yeah. He gives it to John and she gives it to him. So this is definitely a Tim Ferriss project. Like he distilled down the language into these six sentences and you use the same word, right? It's the same verb. It's a, basically the same noun. The verbiage changes a little bit, but it's either it is or we're giving it to somebody. And it, to give is an irregular verb in Spanish, right? To give, yeah. Um, I mean, I guess, yeah, I guess so. I don't remember what the word is. It's dar. Oh, yes, yeah, yeah. Dar. Doy das da, damos dais dan. I guess that's not that irregular. It's not really that irregular, but I guess. I like hacer. Right, right. Like ago. Um, yeah. Yeah. So with those six sentences, and you should give this a try. If you want to, if you're working on a language already, see if you can go through it all. And if you can, I'd say you're probably like a little, you're not a beginner anymore. If you can do it off the top of your head. Yeah. It would be like some grammar complexity. And you said grammar is a little bit more difficult. It's one thing to know the word apple, the color red and someone's name, but it's him and her and we, and if you just go through Spanish, you know, you go through all the conjugations there. Yeah. And I, I think, I think I did look at that at one point and I still like, I think I still even use the one um, sentence that he has there. I can't remember what the whole sentence is, but I know that it had the phrase darselo in it, which mm -hmm. is, which is give it him. to him. Exactly. Give him it. And I still use that in my mind as like a check because the, the object pronouns can get confusing. And sometimes I don't know which one comes first. Like I don't have it intuitively, like, mm -hmm. I can't just, like all the time. Sometimes, yeah, but not all intuitively. And so when I always just go back to that. I just say Darcelo in my head. And yeah. then, okay, like who I'm giving it to comes first. And then the thing comes second. Say is him and lo mm -hmm. is it. Darcelo. Nice. That's where Spanish, we got into Spanish three and that's kind of what lost me, but that's when you actually have real conversations. Cause you don't even say, I want to give you the apple now, or like, I want to give the apple to Tyler. Yeah. It's, I'm going to give it to him. Yeah, yeah, exactly. It's more conversational speech, which is more useful anyway. Cause then you don't even have to know the word. You just say, I'm going to give it to him. Yeah, exactly. So you can kind of cheat out, cheat out on it. But those are, those do get tricky. There, what I notice, and I'm sure everybody goes through this if they've tried to learn a language, but 
you get to a point where like sometimes you'll be in the zone and like I'll be watching something in net on Netflix or listen to a podcast and you'll get in the zone and you'll get everything like it'll just click mm -hmm. all of the all of the grammatical constructions just make sense you don't even have to think about them that you just get it and then there are other days where maybe I'm not paying attention as closely or maybe I'm like thinking about something else in my mind that I'm stressed about or worried about or whatever yeah. and obviously when I'm doing that I'm thinking in English the whole time and yep. so like then there's other days where I'm watching something or listening to something where it seems like I'm like wait I thought I've been studying Spanish and now it doesn't seem like <laughs> I get any of this like now look now I'm finally to the point where I always get at least some of it but right. But there are just some days that are just way better than others. And I think that's just part of it. You know what I mean? Yeah, that's a great point to make because you want to be kind to yourself as you're going through it. Yeah, it's just part of it. Like, yeah, if I throw on something, if I put a podcast in and I'm not paying attention to it at all, I won't know really what's going on. But if you think about it, that happens in English, too. If you put a podcast <laughs> Yes, it in, definitely does. But none of our audience knows anything yeah, yeah, about exactly, that. Right? <laughs> Obviously, I'm talking to you. <laughs> All right. Well, I don't want to drag this thing on too much, but at some point I'd love to talk about the, uh, the DISS for learning or DSSS. DSSS. Yeah. For learning anything and language is just a good vehicle for learning because it's really easy to break down and put into certain pieces and uh, start learning a language. It'll definitely make you smarter and create more neural pathways and then your brain will be better. Boom. I, I dig it get smarter. I'm Anything a, else about language, Ty? Anything you want us to take note of and come back to? Yeah. Last thing I'll say is the reason, reasoning for learning a language for me um, is because I didn't really think of this consciously as I was deciding to do it, but um, upon reflecting, I kind of realized this is why. And I think I, there's a lot of, especially recently, like nationalism across the globe and it's like it can be uh you know it, you need some level of that to protect your country but it can be very dangerous i think when it goes too far and i think language learning is was like my outlet in like my uh rebellion against nationalism it's the opposite it's internationalism right wow. so so i think maybe that was if, if you're trying to extend an olive branch to somebody learn how to speak their language. I absolutely love that in a time when there's hostility and cancel culture everywhere and everyone's so quick to call people out. But I, I, I would appreciate it when someone is trying to speak to me in English and they, and they aren't good at it. Yeah. Yeah. You know, and it is hard to overcome the thought in your head that they're not stupid they're just learning the language. And that's a knee jerk reaction that happens so often. It is a knee jerk reaction, but I promise you, if you start learning a language that goes away entirely, like, Oh I, my gosh, right I don't, away. I don't ever even have that thought anymore. Like not even a little bit. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm like genuinely just like, Oh, this is cool. Okay. Like they're trying to speak English and Hey, I can understand them. That's cool. Yeah. I get along with my neighbor a lot better now, you know, after overcoming this piece oh <laughs> nice yeah. yeah yeah we had a great bonding time over some shoveling we learned some new english words she'd never really seen snow or shoveled snow and uh it was a good bonding experience nice very good took way longer than it should have but that's okay yeah that's okay no i i love it i love your your sentiment there and i'm going to take that to heart because i think uh just being more friendly and kinder and gentler and more accepting of people trying to do cool stuff will make the world a better place absolutely man well that is all we have for you guys today so you know the deal if uh if there's anything you want us to talk about let us know in the comments below and, and we'll, it, yeah and we'll, we'll ignore it we'll ignore it completely um, yeah yeah because we don't care what you think yeah pretty much <laughs> And uh, if you have enjoyed this at any rate at all, give us a like, subscribe, and share with your friends. And we will see you next time. Peace.